Hey everyone, tonight we're going to be hearing from Jimmy Kaplowitz who will be talking about Kubernetes, uh, Google's open source Docker-based workload manager. The uh, title of the talk is Containerizing the Cloud with Kubernetes and Docker. Now this is the 185th monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Um, so, you know, welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to start this as I usually do by uh, very much thanking our space host here, uh, Bloomberg uh, LP, for uh, giving us this space and all the support. It's been uh, really great. <laughs> and uh, we also want to thank all of you for taking the time out to come here. We, we work really hard to um, try to bring you talks that are going to be interesting to you and, and uh, you know, help you out and inform you. And, um, you know, really, really great to see that it, it seems to be uh, well received. In addition to our space sponsor, I'd like to thank our other sponsors, past and present, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and O'Reilly Media for their support. Um, in addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who have contributed greatly over the years and continue to do so. And so, please welcome Jimmy Kapowitz talking about containerizing the cloud with Kubernetes and Docker. Take it away. Hi, everybody. Hi everyone, it's great to be back at Nylog. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a software engineer on the Google Compute Engine team. And uh, I, before I moved out to Seattle, I was helping to host Nylog back at Google. And it's uh, great to see the group so healthy and it's wonderful to see you all. So first show of hands to uh, get a sense of context. How many of you know what containers are? How many of you know what Docker is? How many of you know about Kubernetes? Cool. So it's a good mix of refresher and uh, and new information that'll lead to some interesting mix of questions, I guess. All right. So first, I won't spend too much time on this because you mostly know already. But a quick summary of what a container is. So traditionally, at first, people were running workloads on physical machines, and then they were consolidating their software, their applications on on the same physical machine in separate idealized hardware, virtualized environments. But, we, we, some, but you don't usually need that much to differ between each environment. Usually, that's too heavyweight of an abstraction. You want something that lets your, your code be lighter weight. The, the part that you actually care about that differs from deployment to deployment is usually just your code or maybe your developer's code if you're a sysadmin or a few other categories. So virtual machines are idealized hardware. Uh, you know, they're sort of abstracted away at that level, but you can go a lot higher in the abstraction to abstract the operating system, the kernel, and you can hermetically seal your application in a way that's deployable, introspectable, runnable. And Google's been doing this for a long time, since maybe roughly a decade ago, maybe a bit less, I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, but Docker popularized this in the last couple of years, and that allows us to, you know, work with the community and make a great uh, offering that everybody can use. So why do, why do developers or system administrators care about something of this nature? One reason is you, c you know what your application's environment is going to be like. You can deploy it reliably. You, 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 uh, you know what... So, for example, if you deploy one application into a system and you deploy a different applications into the same system, they might interact, they might change config files in different ways, you have less of an isolated environment. So having a single unit that, you know, it has some of the same, some of the same reasons that go, for example, like to statically link executables, you can, you know what the dependencies are, you know what the context is, and you can update it by replacing. You can do this in many different environments. You can run a, a, a Docker container on a Debian system, on a Ubuntu system, on a CentOS system in Google Compute Engine, Amazon, Vagrant, locally. So you can develop in one of these, run in another, and the context that your application expects is going to be the same. You may need to, you know, the lower levels may need to be integrated in some way with your environment. They may have to deal with your physical hardware, but your application doesn't have to care about any of that. And for those of you who deploy in the cloud, you can pick your cloud based on the merits. And you can choose 
private, public, hybrid, you can do some of your deployments on-prem. The application doesn't have to care. And it lets you write your applications in a loosely coupled way. So one, you could have a back end that talks to a front end. It, uh, you, know, you don't have all the dependencies that lead to this ball of, okay, do I restart this in this order, or that order? If I upgrade this, will that break? This application depends on this version of MySQL, that application depends on that version of MySQL or, or PHP or this module. It's a, you, you can compose applications in granular fashion and you can, you can even add other services that, uh, you know, that are easy to mix in uh, to give you, you don't have to wonder how they're made, you can just plug them in, you can change them if you need to. But So this is, this is all well and good, but it, does it actually work? Yes, it works. Google has been running everything in a container. This includes search, this includes Gmail, this includes YouTube, this even includes our virtual machines in Google Compute Engine, <laughs> actually. Um, so it lets you isolate CPU, RAM, disk, uh, network from each other. It lets you, you know, it lets you know what you're gonna get. You can say, I, I'm gonna have this much CPU. You can say, I want this many copies, this many replicas. You can manage the quality of service. So for example, if you, if you need one user facing job to be low latency and you can allow another batch background processing job to yield to it, you, you, can, uh, you can manage that. You can, you can be efficient about how you allocate your, your workloads across physical machines. So imagine if you have thousands of physical machines you, you know what your usage is, you know how much your application requirements expect you to have, how much you need, and you, you, you can use this for planning, you can use this for allocation across different physical machines in the present, and you can use this to, to track what is what. So if you have, let's say you know you need, let's say you know one user's machines need, you know, four replicas, another's, another's applications need, you know, three replicas, you can, you can track usage back to the need and you can make sure that you're managing your maybe internal chargebacks or your overall budgeting appropriately, know who to contact if that's a problem. So at Google, we start over two billion containers per week. This is not an exaggeration, this is a real number. And so in the, I guess, six minutes I've been talking, seven minutes, it's been probably about a million containers. I haven't done the exact math. Uh, or more, and so it's really, you know, some of them are short lists, some of them are long lists, some of them are number crunching, some of them are user serving, it all varies, but it's a very common pattern at Google, it's the dominant pattern. And it lets us automate, it lets us manage, so I think I covered several of these points already, but it lets us, you know, if we know we need this amount of resources, and we, it lets us say, okay, this machine has only this amount of resources left, it doesn't have a lot of CPU, but you don't need much CPU, so we can shove you in there anyway. And a human doesn't have to decide this. A human can't decide this on the fly. It's not how human brains work. It's what computers are great at. So computers can use little crevices of resources that are left on a machine or avoid crevices being left on a machine, sort of little remnants of this or that. They can say, all of these jobs are using a single CPU, not a fraction of a CPU, so we can put the fractional CPU jobs elsewhere, you know, whatever makes sense. Uh, and similarly, it, can, it allows self-healing, you know, monitoring. So, so if, a, if, a, if, a, if a container goes down, we can recreate it. We can see, okay, how much, how much, how much resources is it using? Is it actually using more than it needs? Is it, uh, is, is it using more than it usually uses even? We, we can introspect them in great ways. So at Google, at Google we have a, a component, this is a high level view of what we have at Google for, for our, for our uh, internal container system. And, and this is gonna be somewhat similar in other environments, but a lot of environments don't go to the very top. So at the bottom there's an operating system. So we, you know, we manage it, we, but we, uh, you know, it might be in your case, Ubuntu or Debian or CentOS or Red Hat, it, at core OS, and you know we we uh, we also add you know Docker 
in, in the case of Kubernetes or, or internal equivalent, but then we, have a, then we have something to manage the containers locally. So this handles the self-healing, the restarts. We actually, in our container-optimized virtual machine images, we ship, we ship something called C-Advisor, which was developed internally, but it allows you to get rich statistics about how your VMs are working, your, your containers are working. And then there's the workloads themselves, the containers that get scheduled. In a simplistic environment, you could just say, I want to run this container, and that's what Docker has built in. You can say, let's start this thing. Let's build a container from this Docker file. But we have a scheduler on top that allows your containers to span multiple physical or virtual machines uh, in an intelligent way. We have this internally, and it's also how we, it's also how we, we, we learn from this experience and this, this expertise, and we, we, we brought this to bear with, with Kubernetes. So in our cloud, it looks somewhat like this. It's the same basic concept. At the bottom, we have an optimized virtual machine image. So it, one thing, for example, it, we make sure that it includes Docker, it includes our, the, the virtual machine part of our Kubernetes agent software. It includes this C advisor thing that I just mentioned. It, uh, it, it's all baked out of the box that to, to, to let you do a simple case without needing to deploy your own Kubernetes cluster. You can, for example, run multiple virtual machine, multiple containers within a single virtual machine. You, you just specify our declarative manifest file that I'm going to talk about next, and you specify that when you create the, the, the virtual machine that hosts all of them, and then it makes it so. And our container manifest is declarative. What this means is you don't tell Kubernetes, start this container or stop this container. You tell Kubernetes, I want this to be running, and it makes it so. If it's not so, it starts. If it's not running, it starts it. If you want it to be stopped and it's running, it would stop it. Similarly, if you, if it dies, it would restart. And, and this allows you to do not only the self-healing, it allows you to do scaling, because you don't have to say, okay, I have three instances, I want 20, let me subtract three from 20 and tell it to start 17 and then see if three of those 17 stop, uh, don't, don't start successfully and so then I'm gonna start the remaining f three but not restart the remaining 14. Humans are not good at that. Software is good at that. So an example of how that works is this gcloud compute command is our command line tool at the top I'll just walk through that briefly. It's, I tested this command recently, it works. So, so this just passes a metadata flag. So you, we have a notion of metadata similar to other virtualized cloud type environments where you can, and we, we've configured, where, we, where you can pass in arbitrary key value pairs. We've configured ours to know how to handle this one. And this is an example of the manifest. I'll get to what that contains in a moment. We tell it a zone to start in, a Google Compute Engine zone. We, we have a, one of our small machine types, F1 micro, um, and then we point to the optimized container VM image with the last two flags. The, the YAML file at the bottom, so okay, a version, of the, uh, a version of the format, a name of the container, let's call it www. We, so we, we're using a, a standard Docker image for Nginx which is a lightweight, you know, high-performance web server. And we, give it, we tell it what ports we want it to listen on. So specifically, we're wiring up ports from the container to the host, the, the, the host virtual machine. So we want whatever, uh, whatever's listening on port 80, in this case, Nginx, to be served on port 8080 of, of the host environment. And this is good because how do you know what's listening? How do you know what's running on your system? In, let's say you find that something's listening on port 8080, what is it? I, if you just have a virtual machine and you just start Nginx and have it go to port 8080, you'd have to do some sort of invasive probing or scanning or you, you'd have to figure out, you know, deductively uh, what, what's running there based on evidence, maybe inductively. But in this case, you can just look at the manifest and you know what, it's, what it is. 
So you can also you can also make it more complicated. You can you don't have to, you can pass two ports. You can have it you can have it listen on the you can you can forward port 80 the normal HTTP port to port 8080, and you can pass 443 through directly. The syntax supports this. Unfortunately, the nginx Docker image doesn't listen on 443, but if it did, this would work. You also can get more complicated. So those are both relatively simple, just running a Docker image and having it exposed at the host level. What if you need to have some shared state or shared data between the two? So what this, 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 form, this file is, is it shows two different it shows a front end, let's say, you have, let's say you're serving a website and it needs data populated from some source. The, the, the data might be fast over the network or might be logs. There's a bunch of different possible sources. Let's say it's you know, serving weather information. Maybe it needs to go query another API and process it, give you, give you some aggregated data. So these, these two VMs have different needs. One of them is user facing, so security is important in one way, and latency needs to be really low because it's serving users directly. Another, an, another, uh, the, the, another uh, virtual, another container data loader is a batch background process, as I mentioned earlier. Those, if those get interrupted just to give a user a more responsive experience, that's completely good. We, the important thing is not that the data be up to the second, it just needs to be recent. So in this case, we have a shared disk, which is ma which is mounted read only in one of the one of the shards. One one of, it's not in read only at uh, mount shard in one of the containers, and it's mounted it's mounted read write in the other container. And so this allows the background weather processing to aggregate the data, do their number crunching, give you their statistical averages, and then write it to a place where it's on disk and easy for the web server to read. This is also the same disk. It's local within the same virtual machine, but it's isolated in that the web server cannot access the rest of the, the data loader uh, environment, and the data loader environment cannot access the rest of the web server, server environment. The sharing is circumscribed to what you have told it to share. I should probably point out at this time that uh, Docker-based containers are not currently a great security boundary, so you don't want to you don't want to use a single physical machine or a single virtual machine for if you're providing a service to the general public to host their containers. For example, you wouldn't want to put one customer's container uh, on the same virtual or physical machine as another's because the technology doesn't have sufficient isolation for that. But for managing isolation in more more modest ways, such as resource isolation, for example, it's, uh, it's pretty good. So here's an example of what's actually happening under the hood in terms of layout. If you're running in, say, a Google, uh, Google Compute Engine virtual machine with our image, what you see here is what's actually on the disk. So on the left is stuff that we handle for you in a normal in a normal virtual machine, you have to handle the operating system. You have to handle making things start at boot. You have to handle logging in. You have to handle you know, monitoring, restarting when things die, or configuring it to do so. Here we handle all of that for you. We handle this in the system, SSH daemon, Docker, logging and monitoring agent. We give you a base OS by default. And you handle this part, but it's actually very circumscribed. The, 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 the virtual machine can sort of fade into the background. It's not really an important detail except that it, you need somewhere to run your containers, but all you as a user have to focus on is this blue rectangle, which is the user app, and maybe you might specify some environment variables and ports and the details of what the, the app needs in its container manifest. But there's a lot that you can just not worry about because it's not important to what you're actually trying to focus on. So in, in our model for the, for the cloud environment, this is a familiar diagram from before, the, the scheduler runs on a master somewhere and it, it handles, okay, 
I have this manifest that says I need these containers to be running. Where do I put them? It, it's, 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 it's not currently as full featured as we hope to get eventually. This is sort of a collaboration with the community on Kubernetes. There's a lot of future directions, but even now it can do things like, I want two copies of this running. I'm going to spread them over multiple virtual machines so that if one virtual machine dies, both of my replicas don't die. It's already smart enough for that. It can even add a third replica. It can remove a replica. It can do things of that nature. And it allows you to find I'm going to get into more detail on some of this as well, but it, it allows you to find the virtual machines, or it allows you to find the containers that are running the service you need. So let's say, let's say you want to, your front ends talk to your back ends. How are they going to find it? It lets you handle that. What we're doing now is a start, and it's gotten much better over the several months that we've, we've had Kubernetes out in the world. We, we initially launched the container optimized virtual machines in May. And then right around DockerCon or Google I.O., we, we, we released Kubernetes. And there's been a lot of contributions since then to make it even better. If it's just Google contributing from our background, it's not necessarily going to meet your needs. If it just works in our cloud, it's not going to meet your needs. We're not trying to lock you in. We know that no one wants lock in, right? So. It, it needs to work everywhere on your development machine, on any of our competitors, on your private cloud, physical bare metal, and it must work well. And not just Google is working to make this happen. In addition to Google, I think the slides mentioned, yeah, the slides mentioned Microsoft, IBM, Red Hat, Docker, Mesosphere, SaltStack, and CoreOS. And there's actually more that are joining all the time, including some since this slide was developed. So it's really a very cross cross-organization effort, I think also maybe Rackspace, VMware. If you check the GitHub repository, you'll see a lot of different names there. So Kubernetes, what, what in the world does this name mean? It's, uh, it's Greek for pilot or helmsman of a ship. And uh, we're sort of getting into the theming with my shirt here, I guess. But um, it, what, so it actually is a pretty appropriate name because you're sort of piloting your, your fleet, your vessels, your, your boats, you sort of making sure everything stays on course with your plans. On, so that's a pretty, pretty good an analogy there. So let's look at how this might work structurally. So you have a bunch of machines that are your hosts. You have the container agent running on them. You have a master scheduler. And, and, and so the master scheduler is going to decide which machines to put your containers on. But you don't just work with an individual container because a toy application like a quick demo might be one container. But a typical infrastructure is going to have database, maybe another kind of back end, you know, API back end service. It might have a front end. So you might have development, you might have production. So a, a, a logical grouping of services that make a logical grouping of virtual machines that make the same application from a high level perspective like my website, whatever that means, those would be grouped into a pod. They sort of share a logical, maybe a logical network namespace. They can talk to each other. They're a, they're a unit, not necessarily on a physical machine. Maybe they are, but, but it's, it's a single conceptual unit of multiple containers that should be treated as a group. So this could include, for example, a web server, similar to my other example with the weather. It has one user-facing container in this case and one back-end batch process. This is a log roller. So for those of you who don't know what a log roller is, web servers keep writing logs. You might need to not just rotate the logs, but maybe you need to ship them off to you know, Google BigQuery, Google Cloud Storage, some other, you know, maybe Splunk, or so, some, some other place to process your logs or store them, aggregate them, et cetera. It's just an example of a, of a common back-end need. And, and so, you're going to have a bunch of pods for this. You might have development. You might have production. You might even have something called Canary, which is a concept where you push out a changed version to a percentage, maybe a small percentage of, of your fleet, your customer-facing fleet. So maybe 1%, and then you go to 10%, and then 50% of, of customers served or requests served. And if there's a bug, 
that slipped past all your testing, maybe not everybody's impacted, and then you can roll it back after, you, after the canaries in the coal mine screech. So um, when you have all of these, and maybe several different developers, not just you know the development branch, but Bob's development branch, or Brandon's development branch, or Jimmy's, you might have a lot of different pods out there, a lot of different groups of containers, and it's a little hard to say, I want this front end and this back end to talk to each other, and I want a lot of replicas for production, but only a couple for development. You need a way to select through them. So we have this notion of a label. It's basically a key value, arbitrary key value pairing, and you can, you can do things like, these are the back ends, these are the front ends. So in here I have green, the, the ones that have the role front end assigned as, a, as an attribute, this would be in the manifest. Uh, but even there, there's a lot of front ends. There's production front ends, there's development front ends. So you need another way to select, not just with one key value pair, but with multiple. And so labels are conjunctive. You can say, I don't want the ones that are front end role, but production stage. So the ones that are in dotted lines were green on the previous slide, but on this slide, they're not matching the query for labels, just the, the three green ones are the production ones in this case. So this is powerful, and you can, you can use this kind of a query to do things. So remember how I said you might want a certain number of production front ends. So here you can specify what we call a replica controller to, to document that wish. You can say, I want four replicas of my production front ends. So I've elided the template of what the uh, front end contains for, for, for screen space, but this can be treated as an object, a sort of active, it's not just a imperative spec where at startup we say, okay, let's run this, let's run this, let's start up four of them, great, they started, okay, we're done. It's not like a for loop either, it's not doing one, then the next, and the next, and the next. It's just, you can think of it as a loop, but it's more like a sentinel, it's a you know, guardian, it's making sure that your wishes stay carried out. If you have, if you have, if you wish for four and you've specified two, or if, if you've started two, if two have started successfully, you, you've wished for four, it'll actually spin up two more containers. If you, try, if you have five running and you've wished for four, it'll kill one of them. If you're running four and you've wished for four, it'll take no action. If the next time it looks one of those four has died, it'll start one. It's a, uh, and if you change your wish, if you change how many you want in the replica, if you want ha if you change how many replicas, let's say you have four running and you say, now I only want three, it'll kill one of them. If you want six, it'll start two. So it's a really powerful model that you're not being imperative, you're being declared if you're saying what you want. And it's the job of the software to make it happen, not the job of the human to subtract, uh, subtract current state from desired state. Yeah, so this is an example going down from four replicas here to one replica, and then back up to three, but not four. So this is all well and good, but how does the front end know what to talk to? The front end, you're gonna have a bunch of front end replicas, you're gonna have a bunch of back end replicas, they need to interact somehow. So we have this notion of a service. And the service is actually a load balancer for you. So you can say, all of these backend production containers, the ones that match this label query of role backend and stage production, let me call them backend service, and I want to be able to reach some backend that's a production backend on port 9000. And it doesn't need to care which backend or how many there are. You don't want to reconfigure your application to go from, okay, there were these four backends, and now there's these six. One of those four also died, and I've restarted with another, and there's two, there's two brand new ones. No one wants to do that, so what this does is any of the containers in this pod can just connect to port 9000, and they're gonna be routed to one of the backend production containers. It's a nice abstraction. You care about what you need to care about, and you can discover it very simply based on, based on this name that you've given to the service. So now it's time for a demo. So I have here, a, so these, these are, this is running in 
virtual machines. These are containers and these are virtual machines in the, you know, Kubernetes Minion 3, Kubernetes Minion 4. They're, con they're uh, virtual machines in Google Compute Engine. They're currently each running a container. Uh, they're showing a Nautilus. It's just a nice, you know, calm Nautilus. But I showed you a cat in a container on the previous slide. And I think we'd like some cats in a container here. So uh, first I should, so, so yeah. So let me show you what's, uh, okay, so what, what this is, is I've specified a manifest of, do I have a copy of the manifest here? This is, yeah, this is probably a version of the manifest. Maybe it's been a slightly different version, but uh, yeah, we, 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 yeah, this is from one of the actual API calls directly, but you know, it's, specifying, it's specifying an image a version of this image that happens to show the Nautilus picture is showing that we want two replicas. It, you know, it's it's an engine. It's probably Nginx on the back. Yeah, it's Nginx on the back end. It's uh, serving on port 80, 80 of each, of each. Uh, so if if you look at uh, this URL that you probably can't see at the bottom, I'm gonna I'm gonna copy the link address and put it. I'm gonna put it here so you can see there's a. There, you know, it's listening on port 8080, and this is just a proxy that's just connecting to both of them and showing. So, yeah, if I, uh, do I have a local pod? Yes. Okay, so, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, scale this up. Let's say we want more Nautiluses. I'm going to run this little wrapper here that, that scales up to four. And what this does is it, this calls our command line tool currently called kubeconfig.sh, and it just calls resize. This, the next parameter here, you, you've seen this name uh, updates, you've seen this name update demo. That's a, replica, that's a replication controller name I'm, that's going here, and it's put the number four. We want four of these running. So now there's four. If you go look over here, some of these are still starting up. That's why they're status waiting and it takes a moment to start sometimes, but uh, in a, once, these are, once these are started, and you notice how these are on four different virtual machines, three, two, four, and one. So it's, it's spread them out over the different machines, and with any luck, unless the demo broke since I got on the subway, it will, uh, these will start up, and then we're gonna have four Nautiluses looking at you. It does refresh, yeah. Yes. There's one. There's another. All right. <laughs> so. It's a feature, not a bug. All right. <laughs> so. Yeah, so let's say we want to scale down to three. I issue the same type of command, and one of these will die viciously. There we go. And the other one's not running, yeah. All right, so let's, I, I talked about cats, not Nautiluses. So I have this other script here, and it's, it's just going to call our, our kubeconfig command, and it's going to specify a different image to use for the container, not update demo Nautilus, but it's gonna specify a different one. So let me call that. And it's gonna have a, it's, it's gonna deliver on my cat promise. Yeah, so this is, this is what it's doing, and it's gonna update one every 10 seconds to give some time. First one might take a bit of time to copy over the uh, the image because no, I should be fine. Demo effect, yeah. So yeah, so. I, what I can do actually once this is, yeah, I can, I, can, I can just run this again. And I actually have this in my path, so I'm just gonna 
do that version instead. Let me let me change this back to Nautilus. Kitten, why are you not showing up? So uh, um, yeah, there we go. Hello, kitten. F1 micros are probably a little underpowered. That you know they're a fractional virtual machine, but it's it's good for a demo. There we go. So if I if I switch this back to the Nautilus, we can watch this, and it's going to replace those with Nautiluses. So the, the, these are actually Docker images that are on my Docker Hub account. Uh, but you know this this demo is actually live on uh, GitHub in well slightly broken version, but it'll get fixed. A ver yeah, the, the demo is on GitHub in our GitHub repository, which I'll show on the last slide. And you can also, if you go to Kubernetes.io, it's there's you can see a more polished version of this talk from 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 a while back. You can see a bunch of getting started links. It's a good user user focus site. All right, so so that's an example of of that. Let me. So you can you can see. So now let me let me just add another. Um, let me just scale this up again. For example. So actually, why don't I list the services? That's probably a more interesting thing to do right now. So yeah, the last slide of the the talk per se is is we're get, we're getting started. So if you take a look at the GitHub repository, it's actually. Strikingly, it's getting like t over 2,500 commits, 109 contributors, many of them not Googlers. If you w if you look at the number of stars, it's more than quite a lot of. It's like over almost 4,000 stars, several hundred forks. It's getting a lot of activity. Many merges have happened today, so it's 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 very much we welcome your involvement, and. So we have we have documentations on how to use our container ver v optimized virtual machines, and we have a IRC channel on Freeno, Google Containers, where you're welcome to talk with us and our developers, and uh, get involved. So, all right, I'm going to turn. We're on taking both our these lessons. Mics. Yeah, qu questions are questions are welcome. I'll just summarize quickly. So, over 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 Google's last decade or so, we've learned a lot of lessons. Some of our software has its, has its warts, but we're learning from those, and we're making something simple, accessible, extensible, lightweight, and compatible with what the external world is using. We're open sourcing those, and we're trying to make cluster management easy so that you can use some of the software development paradigms and deployment paradigms, operational paradigms that, that we use at Google to, in an easy way to manage your clusters, and we'd love to hear from you, including right now for questions. Hey, yep. So questions, we have that mic on, and this one we'll just try to alternate for questions that people have. And a reminder, at the end of the questions, we're going to be doing trivia. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take first one, actually. <laughs> so, um, uh, so, so first question is, uh, this is, this is working, right? Okay. First question is, um, this is, you know, it's got a lot in common with uh, a couple of other projects mm -hmm. out there. And one of the differentiators for something like Mesos and Marathon is, is API access to all of this and, and monitoring and yep. integrating with other uh, ecosystems. Um, what's the direction here, or, or how, how, much, how far are you going to be going with that as well? So I may, I may not have mentioned the API, but everything you saw those command line tools do, it's accessible via a RESTful documented API. You, it's, it's easily accessible via any other tooling you would like to do. We, there's even user contributed Java and Ruby libraries that Google didn't write, and we have involvement from many different comp companies, such as uh, all the ones I listed and more, like Rackspace, VMware, Microsoft, even you know, like there, you can use this on Azure. People contributed support for that as well as Vagrant. You know, there's a lot of a lot of different companies have been blogging. So ecosystem is actually a really good thing. It's evolving, of course. This has not been out for more than several months, but you know, if you if you need if you need a, if you need something to run a really immediate, complex production, you know, scheduled thing right now at a really high internet scale, you may want to use something else like Mesos right, right now. But this is actually getting better all the time, and it has a bright future ahead of it, and it's very much usable for some cases now. Not, yeah. 
Hey, Jimmy, thanks for the talk. Um, yeah. My question is, so Kubernetes makes it so uh, based on your, based on your, uh, what you want. Um, where is that state stored? Is it HA? I, I guess what scares me is, what if there's a problem with the state server? Uh, yeah. What if it makes it so, hey, I don't see anything, so I'll make I think it stores the state in, in ETCD right now, etcd. Um, I, 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 I'm not completely sure. So what, one, one, one thing to note is that if you're running it in a Google Compute Engine environment, uh, the disks are actually pretty reliable. They're not just like a single disk in a physical box, for example. They're, they're replicated and they're, they're uh, you know, it's a, it's a very persistent type of disk. And I, I, I would probably encourage backing it up, but maybe, but I, I, it, there's always pull requests coming in. So for example, in the, uh, in a version of this talk given at Google I.O., somebody asked about quotas. The code doesn't currently support quotas, but it's definitely a direction we want to go. So pull requests are a great way to help make it scale to more, more use cases and reliability levels. I apologize if you answered this in the beginning, but can you compare to like Fleet and some of the other ones? I'm not, I'm not familiar with the intricacies of Fleet right now. I know, th I know that I, I know that not all of these follow this, you know, declarative, isolated model, but uh, but but some some of them are really complex, right? This is simple. If you if you uh, want to use something like Mesos, it's a good product. It works well. It is a lot to install and configure and run and manage, and if you need it, it's great. If but most customer most most needs are not at that scale, you know, most companies are not Twitter or Google. Uh, so this, you know, especially once it gets to what level we consider production ready, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it, it meets a lot of needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes, pick either of these, I guess. So first of all, would you consider Kubernetes a pass or not? And if, if yes, why yes? And if not, why not? Or um, you've made some changes in the demo, which were interesting in terms of like changing the background picture. Yeah. But is that a version change? Um, and is there a version that says, you know, five minutes ago my system was at state X and now it's at state Y and I need to roll back to state X? Or is that really only represented in my command history of the commands I made to the API? So there are logs generated, but the, 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 the main, so this, this would be a release engineering problem for, for any team, right? But let's say, for example, yeah, Kubernetes does generate logs, so you can log the actions it takes. But but if you, including on on the individual virtual machines and the master. But if you if you're doing a real situation, you might not have Nautilus and Kitten. You might have v 0.5, v 1.1.0, and it might be tied into you know your your QA invalidation processes, right? It doesn't replace every bit of good process, but it does mean that you know what's in 1.1.0, it's, it's what, the, what the, the image that said. Or, or you, can also, you can also specify a command, but if you're, in the examples I gave, there's just an image. And so you could say, okay, what's in that image? You know? Hello. Hello. How, how does Kubernetes handle stopping and starting images gracefully versus just killing them uh, and terminating them? And another mini question is, does it support uh, multiple labels per image, or is there a reason why you'd want to use multiple labels, and is that uh, helpful? Okay. Yes, so uh, do it calls Docker, right? It's, we're not re-implementing Docker, so it tells Docker, stop this, uh, stop, this, um, stop this container, and it would tell Docker, Docker run. But Docker run is an imperative model, but that's why we're monitoring to make sure you get to the state you want, and similarly, Docker stop, it's paying attention uh, to, the, to the state of the container you're trying to stop. For, for the other question, labels, uh, yes, you can have multiple labels. In fact, the examples I gave, the front end production, those are two separate labels. Uh, roll front end, you might have roll back end, you might have roll, you know, you know weather service, you know, uh, you, 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 but you also had state production, you could have continent Europe, Etc. Oh, okay. So it's just a key value pair, right? I saw it's a conjunction role. of key value pairs. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. They're all they all apply. Okay. Yeah. And you can query them. Yeah. 
Right. Uh, let's say uh, the Cobret uh, in the background, it works on Docker client. So I would like to know uh, whether it supports all the Docker functionalities or like if we say publish all, it will select, uh, let's say for the, uh, while using Docker, if we say publish all, it will select a random port from the host and pick that up. Is there any such type of functionality in Kubernetes? So when, when we specify the image Nginx in the, in the um, manifest, it did a Docker pull. It pulled it from Docker, so anything that you get published there, it's available. Uh, for, for you, you can also point it to a, a local registry, et cetera. But so, so the other question was about... Um, yeah, if you take the JSON yeah. file, we are specifying uh, the container port and the host port. So if I want to uh, randomize the host port, so is there any way through Kubernetes? So all of these primitives, I'm not sure if it supports that, but all of these primitives are actually getting more powerful over time. So for example, I think the the way that the service, just as another example, the way that the services are load balanced right now is round robin. But you can imagine that you might want to, if you can figure out a sharding function, you might want to shard it. You might want to have a master election and always go to the master. And in the case of the host port, that's a good enhancement uh, that one could make for for uh, something like volumes. You know, the like the, the the shared disk that we were sharing between two virtual machines in the data shard example. You, you, we're not we're, we're supporting a lot of what Docker does, and we're not even being constrained by that either. We're we're actually so so one of the things we're doing is a general volume framework for different types of volumes. What if you want to use a bare compute engine uh, persistent disk or say an Amazon EBS volume uh, as the backing store for the shared uh, bits? Or what if you even want to have a read-only clone of a Git repository as the shared bits? There's a lot of cool things we can do, both supported by Docker and new. I noticed in one of the slides that it seems you're using NFS to share files outside of the container or with other containers. That wasn't NFS. So these containers were living on the, the I think a pod does live on the same physical machine currently. Um, we, the same virtual machine, right? So yeah, same, same uh, operating system level environment. So it was actually bind mounts within, so d containers are within virtual machines. Okay. We're scheduling across different virtual machines, but a pod I think lives on one. I could be wrong about that. I, but 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 definitely the things that are, it's it's smart enough to know that these virtual machines are sharing a volume. So those are definitely going to be scheduled onto the same same machine, and it's going to do a bind mount. We would have, we would love okay. to support things like iSCSI or other network volumes as well. Okay, so basically you're using bind mount to share yeah. files outside of the containers or with other containers. Yes, yeah, in a selective way without exposing everything. You know, for example, one container would not be likely to be able to mess up your Docker config, but we do have, for example, a container on our optimized images with C advisor, which introspects your container situation so that has at least some access to look at, you know, the state of affairs and that just one of the volumes we map in is the necessary Unix socket directory. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. And, and so that I guess conversely you're not then sharing files over the network by some sort of amount method. Not, not currently, but okay. but a volume, the volume framework is pluggable, and you know, we, we so it's also the provider framework is pluggable. This was using you know Compute Engine, of course, but it everything is modular, in a, and that's great for community contributions because we don't want to just be saying, hey, here's this dump of what Google's doing, right? We don't want to be saying, adjust everything you're doing to match what we're releasing if you want to use it. That's not useful. So you know, it's a dialogue, and a lot of these feature requests turn into pull requests or turn into specs or both, and they get added. There's, the rate of change has been incredible. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, so Hi. I think CoreOS also uses FCD, right? And I noticed that it gets really grumpy after like a full cluster shutdown. Is it safe to assume Kubernetes is also really grumpy after a full shutdown? So I wouldn't assume that because you know, you can bring down a, yeah, I, I, I'm not totally sure. So when I bring down a cluster, you know, if, if you bring down a cluster, the way I could bring down a cluster is deleting virtual machines, right, for, for, for development. But, but uh, the, the, the important state in that situation is not in the cluster. 
the important state is in the manifest because you're not saying start this and then stop that and then restart this and then change this to that. You're, the state of what you want is the manifest and that is, a f that is something that you specify. So, does that make sense? I think so, thank you. Yeah. As it's currently architected, are there any single points of failure in a Kubernetes cluster? I think the master may be one. So we have docs, I should probably pull up the docs so that, so if I go to kubernetes.io, you have sort of user style docs, including, including installation, binary releases are actually coming soon, I've seen work on that. We have a more comprehensive demo than what I have here that includes front end in PHP, it includes Redis uh, slave service, which is a load balance talking to Redis master, uh, you know, it's several different layers. It's a guestbook thing. We have a design overview API doc, a, a command line tool doc, and this talks about the, 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 the cluster configuration, the release process, etcd, the master. Also, if you uh, go to the GitHub sites, uh, we have lots of docs in here. So depending on whether your focus is more development focused or user focused, most of, most of that question will be answered pretty well, I think. Other questions? So uh, I'd like to know the difference between a pod that is launched using create pod commands and the, a pod that is launched using replication controller. So create pod in Docker or, or create pod in the, the like the, the container port host port thing in the pod. manifest? Like uh, a pod using that kube cfg command. Right. Yeah. So the kube the cube cfg command I think is is just, so what, what the kubeZFG command is doing is, it's not really, at, it's, it's letting you think a little imperatively, but what it's actually doing is it's getting the current state, it's changing the manifest to say what the desired state is, and it's sending that back to the API so that then it can start converging toward the desired state. And, and so there's no real conceptual difference, right? It's still a port that's being listened to and our software is making sure that the, the traffic is routed through. And so the, 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 if, if it goes in the command line tool, it's going to end up in the manifest. It's just changing the manifest to match what you're specifying. Does that make sense? So, uh, I mean, which one will be resizable? Like, uh, the ports that are launched to replication controller are only resizable? Are so replication, replica controller is the thing you're resizing. You're resizing the number of replicas in a replica controller. So a pod that is launched using create pods command won't be able to resize. So what are you creating the port on? I mean. What is the target of the create port? No, are I'm just trying the guestbook example. Like I'm creating a Redis port, mm -hmm. a Redis master port using the create pods command. And okay. yesterday I tried uh, resizing the, that port, but it didn't work. So I must. Okay. We can look at that. The, the, the concept though is that the, the, the thing that controls how many of an instance you have is the replica controller and the thing that controls how you find something is a service and these both can refer to the same set of containers, each one has a label query and the label query, the same label query should, at the same time for the same set of running containers and the same set of stop containers, though that should point to the same set of containers, right? It's the same label query will get to the same containers. So, if, if you have a label query with role front end and role and, and, and stage production and you have a different, that, that's in your replica controller and you have, you have a service that has the same two labels, you're gonna, the service will let you load balance access to the same, the same, the same um, containers as the replica pool controls the sizing of. replication controller so like uh, because uh, because of that only ready slaves will be uh, will be able to resize only ready slaves more familiar with this demo but let me look uh, yeah, see, yeah so, so the redis the redis slave the redis slave controller so you can you can you can clearly resize the the, the redis slaves by by changing how many of those so yeah, was, there, yeah. was there no was there no in that example yeah, we shouldn't if take you see the redis master yeah. it doesn't have Kind replication controller. Yeah, so kind Redis of master, I don't think it's highly available, is it? Uh, I think that's the problem. Redis master is a single master. Okay. That, that's the reason. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jimmy. I will see you there. Go get your book.
and we'll see you there afterwards. There you go.